it's a bit of after one, so let's begin. Um, my name is uh, Ju Cheong Tam. I'm the uh, director of the Electoral Regulation Research Network. And as many of you know in this room, this is a uh, network that's uh, sponsored by the Victorian Electoral Commission, the New South Wales Electoral Commission, and the Melbourne Law School. And its uh, key purpose is really to provide a forum of discussion and debate uh, that brings together the various groups uh, interested in this very important area of electoral regulation. And I think this is a very uh, fitting event to kick off the year, uh, 2016, because we have this really important work by uh, Jenny newton Farrelly, yeah? Uh, and we also have it launched in a way that, in a way, captures the spirit of the network where we'll have uh, uh, Anthony Green speaking as well as the uh, Victorian Electoral Commissioner, um, uh, Warwick Gately. Um, that perhaps is obvious in terms of the format, but what perhaps is less obvious, and something I want to highlight, is that the success and the energeticness of the network uh, is due in no small part uh, to the efforts of many, yeah? uh, to the support given by the commissioners and the commissions, but also and particularly by the energies and the efforts brought to bear by the conveners of the network. So Jenny, for example, as a South Australian convener, has been uh, responsible in really organizing really outstanding events, particularly in the South Australian Parliament. So I really wanted to acknowledge that. I want to acknowledge, of course, the Victorian conveners, um, uh, two of whom are here, um, Ifu Ng, Brian, Brian Costa, who is not here, and Paul Taunton-Smith. And it's on that note, really, I wanted to hand over to Paul, who's going to take the show on the road, because he's really been the principal organizer of this event. And I think it's my really big pleasure to actually not have to chair this event, because <laughs> Paul's going to be doing the job. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Jin Chan. It's great to be in the book. Okay. Right. Well, as Ju Chong said, this, this uh, seminar, purpose of the seminar is to launch um, Jenny's book and to consider the issue of fairness and equality in electoral boundaries. Now, of course, everybody agrees electoral boundaries should be fair, but what, what does that mean? New electoral boundaries are released, and you've probably seen it in the, in the media the last um, few weeks. Most commentators look at it in terms of their effect on political parties and on the election results that are coming up. So what Jenny's book does is it examines the whole matter of fairness in depth and makes a strong case for a, for a very particular point of view. So, as Ju Chong said, we've got three speakers today. So, first we'll have Anthony Green, who's Australia's best known sophologist. Um, very fancy word for and basically an expert on elections. Everybody will have seen him on, on ABC TV on election nights analysing election results and rapidly producing a meaningful, meaningful picture from a mass of data. If you've seen Anthony's blog, he also considers a wide range of electoral matters, such as possible changes to the Senate voting system, which we might be hearing about in the next couple of weeks. Most importantly for today, Anthony examines federal and state boundary redistributions and discusses the national effect of the new boundaries on the starting point for the next election. Now, this is quite a big job. Um, you can see just this, this publication here, which is not well known, but this is an analysis of the 2013 Victorian state redivision uh, in terms of its effect on the, on the boundaries and the party balance within Parliament. It's, it's a very substantial piece of work, and I, that's, that's, you know, that's the level of work that's required for every, every redistribution. So Warwick Gately, next speaker, has been Victoria's Electoral Commissioner since 2013, and was the Electoral Commissioner of Western Australia from 2003 to 2013. One of Warwick's first tasks here was to work as a member of the Electoral Boundaries Commission on the redivision of Victorian state boundaries, which puts some 30% of electors in different, different electorates. In Western Australia, Warwick oversaw the redrawing of electoral boundaries under one vote, one value legislation. That was a very momentous change. That had been controversial for many years. It went through very big changes to Western Australia's electoral boundaries. The third speaker is Jenny Newton Farrelly. And considering the unique features of its electoral legislation, I think South Australia is very lucky to have Jenny. Jenny has helped develop the methodology to enable compliance with South Australia's fairness requirement, which is unique in Australia. Her PhD was about redistribution methodology, and the book comes out of the thesis. So as well as looking at the big picture, Jenny tracks down the fine details. So I can remember a couple of years ago, Jenny called me to ask me about donut electorates. And they're electorates which are completely surrounded by another electorate. They're very rare, but we tracked down a donut electorate in New Brunswick in Canada. That was 
quite good. They're in the Northern Territory, but yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's Catherine, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think we don't like donuts now. That's right. Yeah. Anyway, look, what we'll do, each of them will speak in turn, and then if there are any questions that, um, as they're speaking, that I think might be sort of general, I might ask a couple of general questions, and then it'll be open to the floor. So I guess I think about um, 20 minutes to, to talk, ask questions of any of the speakers. So I'll now hand over to Anthony. Of course, one of the things about those sorts of publications is they are the calculations that electoral commissioners don't do, except in South Australia. And so um, the commissioners are always very useful, very helpful to me in giving me data on re redistributions and transfers of enrolment. So I can do that publication and then nobody has to ring Paul or Warwick and ask what the political implications of the boundaries are, which really is not their job. Um, look, I've got to say, my, uh, my copy, I think this is a, a terrific little book. I th I, it's an honour to be asked to launch this book and I think it's a great pleasure to actually launch it here today. Um, and I love the cover. Um, anyone who's ever worked on redistributions has a, a, something like that, which is a map of the electoral boundaries with scribbles all over it where the polling places are. Um, you've got very neat handwriting. Is this one yours? Yes, I had um, a coffee stain on it as well, but somehow or other that disappeared. I, <laughs> I, I, think, I like your handwriting. Mine's, I actually just put dots and a number because uh, I have a list of all the polling places. And then once I put all the numbers and I used to go and check one, two, three, four, five, had I got them all. And, um, but everyone who's worked on a redistribution has a map like that. I think it's a terrific book and I think it clearly, clearly justified the PhD which sits behind it. It makes me feel very inadequate actually reading this book because, um, because one, for the vast amount of detail there, it is well organised and structured. It has a good balance of theory all through the book and above all, it's still readable. Uh, and I think this book is actually a tour, de a tour de force on how to do a specialist publication, to do something in quite a specialist field and produce a book which is relatively readable. Um, it was certainly readable for me because I may have the advantage of knowing a lot of the detail which is in there. Some others may be daunted by that, but for me, I could sort of pick through, yes, I know that, oh, that's interesting, so I have some advantages there. The themes of the book um, are about malapportionment, although because this is more about recent political history in Australia, it doesn't deal with some of the wonderfully colourful history. Um, the, the great playmanders of South Australia only get a vague mention in, as part of the sort of background. Um, some of the truly exotic electoral boundaries in Victoria in the first half of the 20th century also don't get a mention and the, the constant battles in the parliament to try and resolve the electoral boundaries in Victoria and how the state ended up for 10 years with a country party premier with the par of the party with the smallest number of members and the smallest vote at elections for 10 years, but they stayed in power. Um, that's a fascinating story, if anyone ever wants to dig that up one day. It deals with gerrymandering, although the term gerrymandering is too often used in this country when people are talking about malapportionment, because the clear cases of gerrymandering drawing boundaries for political purposes is less common in Australia than people imagine. Most of the examples of this have been to do with malapportionment, drawing zonal boundaries drawing zonal boundaries, and then drawing electoral boundaries within those zones. Um, although, of course, when everyone complains about the South Australian electoral boundaries being gerrymandered, that's exactly what they are, and they are gerrymandered because the Act says they should be done that way. Um, it's just that when they don't produce a result, people expect they accuse it of being gerrymandered. So it's a, it's, for anybody who ever says, why didn't the Liberal Party, why can't they just win this election, they really need to read this book and understand the principles behind what's going on. It deals with the issue of the equality of enrolment. It deals with um, issues of population growth. And there's some very good examples comparing Australia with the United States. Um, I'm not familiar with the United States literature on this subject. And I think the, the, one of the excellent things of this book is it does put the South Australian and the Australian experience within that context of something similar that's occurred in America. Although in the United States, when you look at the way they draw their boundaries, and the truly exotic gerrymanders and some of the strange shapes you see, you can understand that uh, it's an utterly different system. Though, as Jenny's explained in the book, the comparison with New Jersey and South Australia, how two, two different jurisdictions have tried to achieve the same end in different manners, is, is very illuminating. Um, it's, in fact, 
I think the chapter on New Jersey, I enjoyed much better than I expected. I thought, I don't know the detail here. This is going to be tough. But actually, it was actually quite a good read. Now, the issue of equality of enrolment has largely been resolved in this country um, in the 1970s. Although, uh, although as um, Jenny raises in the book, there are value, valuable issues, issues to be dealt with there, with things like federal redistributions, which last for three terms. And by the end of three terms of government, the uh, equality of enrolment has got quite out of step um, with what it should be. That there has been a um, the, the lecturers are not equal as they should be, and I think that's a very it's a very useful um, aspect of that chapter, which deals with that. Though of course that's not something that get raised in the political debate, because when you go near this sort of issue, nobody really wants to talk about that. More often, once they've established a set of rules, there is a great tendency for politicians, I think, to like to care about where their boundaries are and they're really not interested in moving the boundaries unless they have to. Um, the issue of projected enrolments is raised. Um, it doesn't apply in some of the states. It does at Commonwealth elections, and it does in New South Wales. Um, where the Commonwealth did know... I'll deal with the New South Wales example, because it's better known to me, that um, they'd put in a 10% criteria in the Constitution and entrenched it in the late 1970s. And then later in the, about a decade later, the Labor Party decided to try and make the boundaries more equal, but they, they, that would require a constitutional change to bring down that 10% 10, 10 limit. So they put a second quota in place, which was a projected enrolment, which wasn't constitutionally entrenched, but was set at the time, it was set that enrolments must be equal at the time of the next election. It was later broadened to 3.5%. But that 3.5% was a much tougher criteria than the 10% on current enrolments. So they actually narrowed the constitutional um, uh, restriction um, and made quite a change to the way electoral boundaries had to be drawn because the, the, the margin for differences between electorals was no longer based on current enrolments. It was based on projections, which you were uh, best estimates only, and were also um, a, a much tighter fit. Fascinating thing out of, the, out of that was in 2004 when they had another redistribution and Colin Barry had recently been appointed to New South Wales and... As anybody remembers, the New South Wales Electoral Commission in the days before Colin Barry, it was a rather quaint little back, backwater of the New South Wales Public Service with people in cardigans who would uh, ruffle some document out of the bottom of a file and show it to you. It was very hard to ever actually find things. They were very good at managing to get all their figures to add up. You're not always sure they were right, but they always added up. Anyway, but Colin, Colin moved up there, um, and after getting all the cardigans off the front desk, he um, embarked on the state redistribution and the New South Wales Labour Party, which has been the dominant party in New South Wales political history, had a bit of a view that it knew how to win elections. It was responsible for the law in the state and it didn't like getting advice on what to do. And Colin arrived up there fresh as the redistribution commissioner, thought this 3.5% projected quota was a nightmare because it made it so difficult to draw the boundaries. Especially it was when he was doing it in 2004, he was projecting three years ahead redistribution had only predicted one year ahead. So predicting three years ahead and trying to get 3.5% was tough. So Colin, having come from Victoria, where the commissions have a long history of making recommendations in reports and redistributions, recommended a series of changes to the legislation on redistributions, in particular lifting the projected enrolment figure to 10%. That was politely ignored by the Labor government of the time. But um, when the O'Farrell government was elected in 2010, it was something they picked up with alacrity. And the numbers were changed, and now there are two quotas for New South Wales redistribution, 10% current, 10% projected. The electorates are much more likely to fit within the 10% limit by the time of the next election. Plus, they didn't have to do quite as much exotic cutting up of rapidly growing areas between districts. There was a little bit more room for slow-growing country electorates to be left well above enrolment, where previously, to get 3% above in a low-growing area involved you having to try and find a fast-growing area to add to it so it would stay within the two limits. So uh, that certainly uh, made it much more practical for redistributions. Now, I want to talk about community of interest because um, Jenny deals with it in the book, though much of Jenny's talk in the book is about fairness and equality, which is an attempt to come up with something which is mathematical, which is a measure you can use to assess fairness and equality. No one's yet come up with one for community of interest. <clears throat> All of the states now have community of interest as a sub-requirement under equality, and in South Australia, under equality and fairness. But it's still there. 
But the submissions, one of the beauties of this book is how Jenny explains how the whole process is now transparent to an extent in this country. You can see the submissions, you can see the comments. Um, what exactly goes on in the discussions, you don't get to see, but you can see the public documents that go into this sausage machine. Um, and the great thing about reading a party's submission is everything is dressed up as community of interest, because I'm not allowed to talk about politics. And the enrolment numbers are pretty obvious. So they all talk about community of interest, but when you read a party submission, community of interest is self-interest. They have a political interest, they want a boundary drawn here for a political reason, but they present it as community of interest. Um, the best example I had of that was the first redistribution I covered, which was in New South Wales in 1991. It was a rather extended process that cut 10 seats, that reduced the parliament by 10 seats, which caused massive dislocation. They'd appointed a judge who'd had previous connections with the Liberal Party. The Labor Party were busy at, you know, attacking the judge who was in charge. And it was, a major, and it was before there was a lot of the software to draw these boundaries. So it was, wasn't quite as electronic as it is now. So it was a tough job to do. And there was this huge argument going on about the boundary between the electorates of Waratah and, and Maitland in the Upper Hunter of New South Wales. And there are, by an accident of geography and history, there's two little towns there called Beresfield and Woodbury. And where the way the Hunter floodplain is built, they're on the sort of slightly higher ground surrounded by floodplains. So these two little towns don't have much around them, but they're there. The commu commuter <coughs> suburbs of Maitland and, Beresford and, and Newcastle. But by an accident of history, the two towns are separated by a council boundary and Woodbury's in Maitland and Beresfield is in Newcastle. And the commissioner didn't use that boundary. He put Woodbury in Waratah, not in, not in Maitland. Maitland was more than just the Maitland local government area. And the Labor Party were desperate to get Woodbury into Maitland. Maitland was going to be a marginal seat, here, seat on the draft boundaries, and they needed as many Labor votes in there. And at that election, um, at that redistribution, the debate, Mr. Link, Judge Dink, Lincoln decided that he had to let the debate go as long as possible. He'd been attacked. There were 21 days of hearing in that redistribution, which is extraordinary for anyone who's had to do this. But they spent two and a half days on the boundary between Beresfield and Woodbury. And they discussed where the video shops were, where people played cricket, <laughs> where they went shopping. And this went for two days um, on this process. And in the end, uh, the commissioners left the boundary where they'd originally drawn it. Now, to show that sometimes these arcane debates are important, at that election, the Griner government only got back, what, got back one seat sort of majority. And one of the seats they won was Maitland. And they won Maitland by about 300 votes. In Woodbury, which hadn't been included in Maitland, the Labor majority in Woodbury was 800 votes. If the Labor had won that two-day argument, Labor would have won Maitland and the Griner government may not have survived much longer. So when you hear these strange community of interest debates going on, over something quite small like that, sometimes it does, it can matter. Um, Jenny raises some interesting examples in the book about US, exa US examples of community of interest, uh, particularly to it's an issue that doesn't come up here very much, which is about minority groups. Um, should you draw electorates so that you get African-American representation or Hispanic representation? And the debates they've got in New Jersey about the best way to achieve that. Should you draw a boundary which is guaranteed to get an African-American MP? Or is it better to have African-American voters split over several electorates where their interests are actually influential in more than just a safe seat? This is an ongoing debate all across America. And the use of... Um, power to get the to drawing of boundaries to get African Americans erect, elected from North Carolina, for instance, to the US Congress is an ongoing issue because in doing so they managed to lock up all the Democrat votes in a very small number of constituencies. So it's interesting to see that example raised. And we do have that issue here uh, from time to time about um, how areas are best represented. <coughs> um, I liked your discussion of Brisbane, um, where you mentioned this, this argument that um, that the voting patterns of Brisbane are uh, uh, oh, show examples of segregation by elevation. Yeah. The, 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 the rich people live at the top of the hills and the poor people in the floodplains. Um, it's an observation you can make about Adelaide, where the Liberal vote is high around Mount Lofty and drops off all the way to Port Adelaide. Or in Sydney, where we always like to say that, um, you, that you put the word heights after a suburb, and there's a lot of Sydney suburbs where you suddenly get Fairfield, which is a relatively working class suburb, 
and a bit of it suddenly becomes Fairfield Heights. And you can add 10% to the Liberal vote if you do that. This is a, one of those peculiarities of Sydney. And you can do aerial maps of Sydney and where all the trees are vote Liberal, and where there aren't trees, it tends to vote Labour. And where the, where the streets are all in a cross pattern, they tend to vote Labour. And where they're sort of ground, widen around in the outer suburbs, they're a bit more marginal. There's, there's all sorts of funny aspects of geography that occur. And much of that is just sieving by house prices. Where you can afford to live, where you live in Sydney, depends on how much you can afford. And that's why it's got such stark differences. The joke I make about Melbourne is you don't see those patterns. There's east and west of the Yarra. But um, it doesn't matter how much money you've got in Melbourne, you can't buy a house which looks down on someone. So um, and there's, there's different sort of patterns develop in Sydney compared to, uh, compared to Melbourne. Um, I always love some of the comments in redistributions. Um, there were some towns moved out of the election of Broken Hill in New South Wales, out of Dubbo, and moved into Broken Hill in Sydney, in New South Wales. Broken Hill's in the far west of the state. There's not much else in that part of the state. And the number of people who wrote in and sort of saying, I don't want to be in the electorate of Broken Hill, I shop in Dubbo. Um, it's a very common remark. It's sort of what pe people think it somehow changes their lives. Um, I suppose some people do visit their MP more than I've ever done, but I mean, it's still one of those common remarks that comes up. You talk about donut seats, and of course, Catherine is the example. I think there were some in the 40s and 50s. I think... Um, Bendigo and Midland. Midland was a seat I think used to completely surround Bendigo. It was a long time since it's gone, but the standard in Victoria now is to split Bendigo into two seats with surrounding rural areas. But there was a long stage when Catholic Labour voting Bendigo was one seat and rural Midland was completely surrounded. So we've seen examples of that in the past, and it does raise a very interesting case in places like Townsville and Cairns at state level, where there's more than one seat in the district. Um, in the redistribution in Queensland in 1999, they decided just to try and renamed the central seats of Townsville, of Cairns and Townsville. They tried to call them Cairns Central and Townsville Central to distinguish them from the other Townsville and Cairns seats, which had different names. It might have made absent voting easier when people came and said, I live in Townsville. Well, do you live in Townsville? Well, the seat is Townsville. Anyway, the parties hated it for some reason. They didn't like having the seat names changed. Um, and so that didn't happen. But an interesting thing in, in the Northern Territory is if you pick up a street map of Alice Springs, um, there is always, I, I didn't realise it until I started to try and figure out some redistribution boundaries one year. There are things that are not shown. What are not shown on street maps of Adelaide, of Alice Springs, is the town camps where all the indigenous population live. And for a variety of reasons, historically, the town camps are all in an indigenous local government area and they're dotted around Alice Springs. And to get um, <coughs> local government statistics from the census, the, the um, a, 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 ABS create census districts for the town camps so they can accumulate them for the, for the I think, Tangatiri local council. Um, and I didn't know they were there because they're not only street maps until one redistribution, they draw these very strange boundaries around the edge of Alice Springs. And what they were was they were putting all the town camps in the surrounding outbank electorate rather than in the Alice Springs electorates. Now, since that Alice Springs has stalled in population and most of the town camps are now back in an Alice Springs seat. But even the most redis recent redistribution has some very strange looking boundaries where they'd obviously cut out a town, ca town camp. And it comes to this issue of community of interest. Is the community of interest of the town camp with Alice Springs or is it with the other indigenous people in their area? Because often people are coming from the rural areas into the town camp and going back. So there's an argument about community of interest there. A fabulous one I love in Sydney was um, there's a bridge in Western Sydney called Silverwater Bridge, which was built in um, 19, uh, 1970. And it connects an industrial area south of the river called um, Silverwater with suburbs of Rydalmere and Ermington on the north side, which is an old housing commission estate. And for many years there, the, um, um, the Liberal Party always had difficulty drawing boundaries in the sort of upper western part of Sydney because of these housing commission estates along the river. Anyway, the... Um, Asking government forced through a redistribution in 1973 by changing the numbers of members of parliament. And um, someone very cleverly came up with this idea there was a new community of interest between the, housing, the working class housing commission suburbs of Silverwater and Ermington and Auburn in south of Silverwater Bridge. And for the only time in history, the boundaries crossed the Silverwater Bridge and, and took away those annoying housing commission estates on the north side so you could get two liberal electorates at Parramatta and Ride. So you often see those sorts of things. Um, um, Sometimes you get jokes in party submissions. Um, the New South Wales Labour Party used to regularly try to have the electorate of Londonderry renamed Derry. If you know your Northern Irish history, you'll understand that joke. <laughs> and they, um, they also kept trying to rename one of the North Shore seats in Sydney as Asken after one of our less um, 
less um, reputable former Liberal premiers of New South Wales. And oddly enough, the Liberal Party always opposed that suggestion. No one ever mentions Robert Askin very well in Australian politics. Um, but also people, there are competing co communities of interest, and we've just seen one in, in um, New South Wales recently with the redrawing of the federal boundaries. The city of Paterson has been completely redrawn, and it was always going to be redrawn in, a very, in, in that sort of way. And people argue it didn't match a community of interest. Well, the only way you could fix the community of interest the way the Liberal Party was suggesting was to take, go all the way up the north coast and go up into the New England tablelands and take Tenterfield out of New England and stick it in a north coast seat. But which is the more important community of interest? Port Stephens, the north side and the south side of Port Stephens, or Tenterfield versus Lismore in the north of the state? You get competing community of interests that are occurring. And so when you argue community of interest on one seat, sometimes the commissioner, commission can't accept that community of interest because of the knock-on effects elsewhere. Um, what Jenny only dealt with briefly, because it's really only a feature of New South Wales politics, is the change of numbers to force a redistribution. Um, the Labor Party increased the numbers in New South Wales from 99 to 109 in 1988 as a deliberate attempt to malapportion the state. They thought all their rural electorates would be sunk down on the major towns where the Labor Party vote lived. And that was their intention in increasing the numbers. And they locked up a whole bunch of Liberal votes in some seats, made their own seats marginal. And it meant when the Grana government was elected in 1988 with a very large majority, its actual hold on power was quite narrow. It had 56% of the two-party preferred vote, but would have been defeated by a 2.5% swing because of the differential way that the, the seats, the boundaries had been drawn. So it reduced the numbers by 10 to force another redistribution, which produced a fairer set of boundaries. In 1999, the Labor Party, thinking it was in trouble in its first term, decided to do something similar. It changed the numbers of members of parliament, thinking the 93 seats gave them the best chance of maximising their, uh, their vote. Unfortunately for them, the commissioners drew a very fair set of boundaries by any measure, and the Labor Party had to fight the next election on boundaries that didn't particularly help it. It won, but it was a bit of a shock for everybody. But there were three, K, three, three times in 15 years that numbers were changed. Um, in a way which parties did, particularly for their, for their partisan, partisan reasons. Um, some things that Jenny didn't deal with, um, the order electorates are drawn. Um, this sometimes has an impact. Um, I'm most familiar with New South Wales. They tend to start drawing at the corners of the state. They draw along the coast, the pointy ends of the coast near the harbour in Sydney, and then move inland. And what you get is a bit like a bulldozer pushing land. You're, you're, you're par pushing partial quotas outwards. And you suddenly reach a point where you get a seat which doesn't make any sense. And you go to Western Sydney or you go to parts of the eastern suburbs of Melbourne, you get seats which have got no particular community of interest. They're clearly leftovers. I mean, I can look at them and say, that's a leftover seat. The seat of Castle Hill in Sydney and Epping up on the upper North Shore, they're both quite safe, 20% Liberals. No one pays any particular attention to the community of interest of those seats because nobody cares. They're really safe. No one pays any attention. And every election, it's a rather odd-looking electorate which just connects a bunch of suburbs. And I think that's something that comes out of um, the order elections are drawn. And you mentioned the, the federal redistributions in 2006 and 2009. What's interesting there, the 2006 was a rather radical departure for the redistribution. The boundaries ended up quite different than they had been for 20 years. My observation, it was pretty clear they'd started drawing in Sydney and gone outwards. Whereas most other redistributions, they sort out the country first and then come back to the metropolitan area. But um, it's a peculiarity of, of New South Wales that Sometimes you have to make up your mind what you're going to do with Broken Hill and then the rest of the state falls out. But if you start somewhere else and end up with Broken Hill and the rest of the state, your numbers suddenly don't up, add up and you have to start again. Um, naming. Um, the most famous one is McPherson in 1977 where Reg Withers, the Senate leader of the government, rang up the commissioners to try and get them to change the name of a proposed boundary. Because if it had the name McPherson, the Liberals had, to run, had the right to run for it. If they changed the name, the national, the, the country party could run. He lost his job over that, but that's one of the clearest examples of, you know, someone changing the names. Um, a favourite of mine was, again, this area of Ermington in Sydney. It's, you know, Sydney's all about the dress circle and the stalls. Ermington's along the river, working class, housing commission. You go up the hills to Carlingford, it's much ritzier, much richer. And the Liberal Party in 91 got a set of boundaries drawn, which ran from the river up through Ermington to Carlingford, and they called the seat Ermington. The people of Carlingford didn't want to live in a seat called Ermington. They wanted it called something else. So they, the Liberal Party tried to get the name changed, but they used geographic names, so Ermington stuck. But it's another example of getting people getting rather antsy about names. Um, Warwick, had, no, this one, um, 
the last redistribution in Victoria, there were seats of Benalla and Seymour. And Benalla was a national seat, Seymour was a Liberal seat. When they redrew the boundaries, there was a new seat called Eildon, which was pretty much a Liberal seat. Seymour was t moved north, took in large parts of Benalla, but retained the name Seymour, but had a notional national majority by the votes. And the Liberals were saying, ah, Seymour's our seat. And they were about to get a terrible fight over this. And at the final stage of the boundaries, the electorate was, named, was changed to Euroa, which solved a lot of the problems. But it shows sometimes that these sorts of names, if it has no particular intrinsic importance, sometimes names just get changed. Anyway, but that, that was a, an interesting one. Um, the New Jersey has some interesting examples. They have voluntary voting, um, you know, not always compulsory enrolment. How do you make a fairness criteria work in those situations? An interesting example of that in, is in Australia is the Northern Territory. Um, the turnout in the Indigenous outback electorates is much lower than the urban electorates. Mm -hmm. So on the votes, there is a bit of a bias towards Labor in the electoral boundaries because of the low turnout. That's not an issue which is assessed in this country and realistically shouldn't really be assessed, but it is there as a factor. And it does raise the question, if the fairness criteria which is used in South Australia is used elsewhere in Australia, how does it deal, as Jenny mentions, how does it deal with optional preferential voting? Because you can't come up with a state figure which isn't distorted by the fact that not everybody gives preferences. Um, and I think that the, just going back to South Australia, which is Jenny's specialty and what's been mentioned here, there are some peculiarities in their process. Um, I have some disagreements with the way they deal with, with declaration votes and how they're allocated to, to electorates. Um, for someone like me who has to cover an election and has to start with a set of margins and numbers at the next election, what's always fascinating to me is the Commission has an unchanged electorate but the margin changes according to their criteria. The Commission has a set of procedures it follows which are about meeting the criteria for fairness, which means trying to predict where population growth will take an electorate and therefore the new margins for an electorate meet their criteria at the last election. That's not much use for me trying to pick an election if they've changed the margin in an electorate because if I want to use that margin, I have to go and change the results in all the polling places as well, or my swing doesn't work out. So they produce these nice margins, which people take as gospel, which meet their criteria, but I argue, well, that's fine for their criteria, but that's not what I do for a living. So I cause some consternation sometimes by coming up with my own margins and not using the, the commission's figures. Uh, and I do think that the postal and pre-poll issue is becoming a major issue for fairness criteria. How do you allocate that vote to areas? If you get, um, I think it was about 40% of the vote at the Fisher, by, um, Fisher and Davenport by-elections were pre-poll and postal. If you get that sort of figure at a, at a state election, it's very hard to allocate that to, a, to new, a new division. But look, I think this is an excellent book. As I said, I think it's a tour de force for how to do a technical book. Um, I think it brings together in one book all the literature on this subject. And uh, look, I think it's um, congratulations, Jenny. Congratulations on the degree and congratulations on the book. Thank you. Um, Anthony, that, uh, that national analysis is very hard to follow, so I won't attempt to go there whatsoever. But, uh, but Jenny, look, congratulations on a terrific book. Uh, a very good piece of research, very strongly supported with, uh, with analysis as well. And as I said to you earlier, I think Chapter 6, which looked at particularly South Australia, w was very strong. Not that I understood every element of it, but a very powerful chapter. It does uh, lift the lid on the processes around the redrawing of electoral boundaries, and it does strongly argue that... Uh, electoral boundary commissions should consider political data as a performance requirement in drawing those boundaries. And indeed, Jenny leaves us with a toolkit that includes this requirement. Now, I won't answer whether that's needed or not. I'll leave that to you to look at the book, make your own judgment, listen to Anthony's uh, dissection of the book and also my comments as well. I'm going to talk from my experience as a commissioner in, in Western Australia and in Victoria and involvement in redrawing state boundaries on three occasions. So two occasions in WA, uh, the one vote, one value redrawing in 2007, which was complex. Uh, and then that was followed up with the 2011 redivision in Western Australia. And then of course, the 2013 redivision here in Victoria. Look, Jenny makes the note that the processes are impartial and transparent. And I absolutely agree with that uh, from the perspective of being involved in those three Redivisions, but Jenny questions whether that of itself uh, 
is good enough. And again, I'll leave you to make your own judgment with respect to that. I thought it very worthwhile if we very quickly look at the arrangements that exist in WA and Victoria. They are quite similar in relation to the construction of the Boundaries Commission and the various factors that need to be considered. In Western Australia, at the 2007 redivision, the chairman was the Chief Justice. That changed uh, subsequently when it became a retired Supreme Court judge. Uh, joined by the Electoral Commissioner and the Government Statistician, which, which in that case was the ABS officer uh, appointed to Western Australia, which also picked up the title of the State Government Statistician. In Victoria, the Chief Judge of the County Court, the Electoral Commissioner and the Surveyor General. Uh, Redivisions occurred in Western Australia every four years post the One Vote, One Value Act in 2005. In Victoria, it's after every two general elections, which in the case of the last redivision was nearly, I think, 12 years, Paul, between, uh, which is a long time between redivisions. As to quotas or tolerances, Anthony mentioned that, Western Australia plus or minus 10%, Victoria plus or minus 10%. In Western Australia, they have uh, what they call a large district allowance where if a district is over 100,000 square kilometres, the tolerance goes to minus 20% to plus 10%, so that gives you the latitude in those very sp uh, sparsely populated areas. And you also include phantom electors into that, so it's quite complex uh, to get your mind around that as well. With respect to the factors that must be considered, or the criteria, there are, they are essentially the same in both states. Western Australia has actually in the Act that you must consider existing boundaries of regions and districts, and you must consider existing local government boundaries. That's not the case in, in Victoria, although other boundaries do get uh, a degree of consideration when you're looking at, uh, at district boundaries. And I will say that video shops, Anthony, are not a criteria in both states. <laughs> uh, just with respect to the boundary composition, I've mentioned who makes them up. I think it's accepted and expected that uh, boundary commissions will be apolitical. And when you look at the, at the people that make up the commissions, my, my view is that, that that comes naturally with that grouping of people. Um, maybe it could be argued that that's not the case, but I believe so. There's also no appeals process. Now, that does strengthen the independence of, of the commissions as well. It takes Parliament out of the equation, and the boundaries that you get at the end of the process are final boundaries that cannot be appealed. Now, in, in WA, and I notice uh, it was a provision post the 2011 uh, redivision where the Act was changed subtly. In WA, the Commission has, has the powers and protections of a Royal Commission. The protections clause was added post-2011 for a reason that I won't go into in great detail, but that's not the case in Victoria. WA, the powers and protections of a Royal Commission, which, which strengthens, I guess, your ability to remain distant from inquiries in relation to the decisions you take. But you might want to look at that as well, Jenny. Um, but my experience uh, with two commissions now is that the, the members of those commissions go to great lengths to be apolitical, they go to great lengths to be open and transparent, and they go to great lengths to preserve that, almost at all costs. Very quickly looking at the factors. Um, Anthony mentioned the numbers criterion. They are fixed in both states and they must be satisfied. You cannot move away from that. With respect to the other factors, there's no weighting or priority applied to those. The factors do come into competition when you look at it on a district by district basis. And as Anthony mentioned, that there might be a very strong community of interest consideration in one district that will have an impact in an adjacent district where it might be the lines and means of communication and transport that have a greater, uh, I guess, a greater prevalence in, in the adjacent districts. So whilst there is no weighting or priority, they are all given equal consideration, but some compete a little more, uh, more fiercely than others with respect to, uh, to the district uh, final makeup. I think it's reasonable to say also from my experience that, that some of the decisions that have been taken by previous commissions are also respected. Now, there's a comment in the book that, uh, that a no or minimum change model is preferred by commissioners. Now, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think when you look at all the various factors, and they all come into play, it is likely that a minimum change model is going to fall out of that. Now, I look into the WA experience. 
And for example, the regional towns of Bunbury, Geraldton and Albany, as examples, when you looked at the local government boundaries and you looked at the population numbers, they fell very neatly into their own standalone district. There was no need to, no need to move away from that. And, and fortunately, that occurred in two four-year redivisions. So, so why go from that? So people would say that's a no or, or minimum change model. Well, yes, but it, but it was a natural fit. Why, why move away from it? Um, but sometimes, of course, when all the factors come into play, you, you don't have an option but to undertake a change. And Paul mentioned it earlier. The, uh, the, the redivision uh, that occurred in Victoria, there were 30% of electors affected by that change. So that was about just over 1 million electors affected by that change by virtue, I believe, of the time between redivisions. Now, in, in the WA example, one vote, one value uh, boundaries in 2007. Next redivision, four years later, 2011, 8% of electors were affected. So you had a four-year term, 8%. Here we had 12 years, 30%. So in, in, the, in the case of Victoria, it had to be a big change, by ver purely by virtue of the numbers as well. It, it had to be a big change. And as much as all the other factors came into play, whilst you might, you might have wanted to, to limit the amount of change, you could not do it. It had to be 30%. I noticed in WA as well uh, that, uh, and it started in 2011, where we put out a preliminary observations paper prior to the redivision starting. Now, this is not a legislative requirement, but the chairman at the time thought it worthwhile doing in preparing the ground for the redivision that was about to occur. And, and we put out a minimalist approach, that's probably the no change model, an incremental approach, or a fundamental change approach in advance of the work, uh, the work being started. Now, and that was to, to get the community uh, to think about what those changes would mean. And, and the support came back for an incremental change. And, and again, you need to look at the report to see what that meant. So that was, a, that was an attempt by the Commission at the time to prepare the ground as to what the community would accept in relation to the change that was about to be undertaken. Uh, I believe they continued that into 2015 as well. So you might want to have a look at that. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of that, Jenny, in any event. I've mentioned uh, the period of change as well. Um, Jenny talks a bit about tolerances and she argues for that plus or minus 5% in her toolkit. Look, I think you could get there. I think you could get there in a four year, in a four year model, but any longer than that, gee, it would be a challenge to try and keep those numbers, particularly when you look at some of these large areas of growth uh, that are occurring. And you know, when we look at the Victorian model as well, um, in the period between the, two, the last two elections, the growth across the state was something like about 300,000 electors coming into Victoria. That, that's electors. Huge change. Um, Jenny talks a bit about the political effects of the work that the commissions undertake and, and offers up in the book that, that the commissions don't engage with submissions or objections about the political effects of their maps. That is very true. There is no detailed analysis other than in South Australia as to the, uh, the effects of the, of the maps that have been created. Now, that's not to say that the inputs of the various political parties are ignored because they do put in submissions and those submissions are considered against the criteria on a, on a district by district basis and as to the merits of that submission as well. And, uh, and, where, and where parties argue for, for, for reasonable changes, often those changes are accepted as well. So, so whilst we don't go into the detail of the numbers and balance the numbers, we do listen carefully to what the parties put up, because on occasions they put up some quite good ideas with respect to particular districts. Um, I'm just going to close now, and I'll let Jenny, you can do the talking now. And I do think this is a great piece of work, and I commend you for that. And I'd encourage those here to, uh, to pick up a copy of it and read it. Um, I would say that I, I guess um, as a vote in support of the work we do, when the maps are finally distributed and published, where you have every political party complaining about the maps, then you know you've been successful. <laughs> but as to adopting the South Australian model with respect to performance requirements, I think that's a matter for Parliament, Jenny, and I won't comment on that. But Jenny, a great piece of work. Very well done. Congratulations.
you to those. Thank you very much to those two previous speakers. I'm feeling a bit embarrassed. I thought I'd come over here and we'd have people talking about the, the topic of redistributions and then at the end somebody would say, by the way, there's this book and if you want some more, you have a look in the book. Um, so to have people say such nice things, I'm quite overruled. Thank you. Um, the, the topic was one that I took on because South Australia has a funny geography. It ties up a lot of Liberal votes in very safe country seats that are not matched by similarly safe Labor seats in the city. And so that means that for many years when the Boundaries Commissioners were drawing districts without looking at the political consequences of the lines that they drew, they inevitably disadvantaged the Liberal Party. Now, South Australia had a long history of advantaging the Liberal Party. You will have all probably heard of the Playford, um, well, some people called them gerrymanders, but it was malapportionment. And Playford stayed in government for 26 years, a lot of the time on the back of redistributions that advantaged his party. So, of course, Labor, <laughs> Labor wasn't terribly keen on being sympathetic to the Liberals, but there was a change made, and that change said to the redistribution commissioners, when you draw a map, please look at this stuff. And there was a standard that was actually introduced so that people would be able to say, well, how do we know if we're getting close? to remedying this problem. And the standard was, well, if a party gets the support of a majority of voters across the state, then in theory they should win a majority of the seats and that will enable them to form government. In fact, it hasn't worked. But when I took on this project, it was working. <laughs> and so I took on the project and I, what I was thinking was, OK, this is a topic for a PhD. What would you need to do to, in terms of methodology to make this kind of thing applicable elsewhere in Australia? So how would, how would you do this sort of thing if you had a voting system that didn't give you a statewide two-party preferred vote? So Queensland and New South Wales, where they have an optional preferential voting system, how would you do this? Or how, how would you do it in a situation where, well, other, other states have their intricacies? And Western Australia and Queensland have quite large remote areas and they, instead of giving more resources to the members who represent those areas, they cut down the size of the areas um, by uh, including what Warwick was referring to as phantom electors. So anyway, how would, you, how would you apply this sort of thing elsewhere in Australia? And then, of course, I was, I was sitting at my desk at one stage and I thought the whole basis of the South Australian system is that the parties thought and honestly thought that their campaigns were roughly equal and that if you had, if you used the pendulum and the statewide two-party preferred vote and you assessed the map as roughly fair on the basis of past elections, on the basis of the most recent election, then everybody would say, well, it's roughly a fair map. We will now go into an election and try and mess it up. <laughs> We will now try and do better than that map. We'll concentrate on marginal seats. And if you win a marginal seat, you actually increase your share of, of the votes very little because you only need another couple of hundred votes sometimes to win a marginal seat. So you're not actually increasing your share of the two-party preferred vote across the state very much at all, but you're getting much closer to winning government. So a party that can win that can run a really slick marginal seats campaign might actually come in at under 50% 50, 50 of the statewide two-party preferred vote, but win a majority of the seats. 
so we've had this problem <laughs> that essentially with with the geography there needed to be a fix the fix hasn't actually worked but in order to try to understand how it might work people needed to think more about what is it that we're doing when we're drawing lines and how do the parties then go out and campaign on the basis of districts that last time might have been marginal, the time before might have been safe for either party. How do you do this business of actually drawing a fair map? If you draw a map that might have been fair at the last election, is that likely to be fair at the next one? So now we've got a situation where there's a debate. There is a redistribution happening at the moment. And I think the debate this time for our redistribution commissioners and for the parties will be, how do you measure support? Do you take just the, most, the results from the most recent election? And if that was a really unusual one, is that, is that a wise decision? I suggested last time that they use the results from three elections to see whether, the, whether there's a sort of normal vote or a, you know, a vote that could be relied on or an expected vote within an area. Anyway, that got me into a bit of trouble, so I won't go into that too much. And the Commission took my, accepted my submission and said, oh, good, yes, OK, that means that our map wasn't biased, made very minor changes, and the Liberal Party was outraged because had the Commission stuck to their normal procedure, they would have given, they would have drawn four Labor seats as notionally Liberal. So the Liberal Party thought that in accepting that argument, the Commission had disadvantaged them and they want to make sure that that sort of thing is not done this time. So I think the question is, how do you measure support? And another one is, if you draw a map that you think is a level playing field for people to go out and campaign on, how do you assess that it was a level playing field? Do you use the results from the next election and look back and say, oh, well, actually, it wasn't a level playing field. Or can you only assess that at the time that you draw the map on the basis of previous elections? Because if you can only do it on the basis on, at the time that you draw the map and you have to get the agreement of the parties then to say, yeah, all right, that looks vaguely OK, we will now go out and campaign on the basis of this map and try, obviously, to do much better than each other. What if the parties refuse to agree that that was a fair map? What are, the, what are the criteria that you will use to stand up and say, this one will do, this one's fair? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's actually, I'm not sure that it can work. It's one of those situations where People have tried very hard to be fair. They've introduced um, criteria for, for assessing whether a map is fair. And now I think campaigning has surpassed that. And I think campaigning is getting to the stage where a party can probably with enough money can probably run a really good campaign and win even on a biased map. Maybe they shouldn't have to. You know, maybe the map should be fair in the first place. But it's getting to the point, I think, where maybe we should be saying you do the best that you can with the map and then you regulate party financing and you regulate a fair campaign. So that's for the next generation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I do have copies of the book. I don't own them. They belong to the publishers. If you would like to buy them, they're $55 each, which sounds like a small fortune, but it's probably a good read. Um, there is something in there that I think is useful to people, if I can just put in a plug, apart from the index. 
there's a bit at the back that compares the, the provisions around Australia. So if you want to know about the requirements for, for example, the tolerances, it just goes through state by state and includes the Commonwealth as well, or the expected duration of a map. Um, so if anybody is actually likely to be working on this area, it's probably a good reference book just for the appendix. Thank you. Just have time for a couple of questions. Would, would speakers be able to maybe go up the front and the, sit, put the chairs up the front? Oh, maybe stand. Oh, whatever you like. Um, and I think I think it sort of opened up to questions because I don't want to do a sales speak. So, any questions for anybody? Back was first, and then here. <laughs> the, um, question for Jenny, although the, the, the others might um, <coughs> have something to say too. Um, in your research, did you look at any jurisdictions, I'm thinking of the local example, particularly New Zealand, where the actual electoral boundaries do not determine the party strengths in Parliament? Um, and I'm, the, the, the question is, how much less controversial does that make the whole boundary drawing procedure? If you've got a, uh, a system where your boundaries are going to determine <coughs> who the local MP is, but they're not actually going to be critical for who ends up forming government, does that take most of the heat out of the process? Mm -hmm. And um, therefore, if so, is that something we should be uh, mm -hmm. trying to move towards? Anthony may be able to answer that better than me. I didn't look at New Zealand. Um, there are quite a lot of people in South Australia who think that that's probably the solution for us. But we've got quite a small parliament, 47 in the lower house and 22 in the upper house. And it would kind of make sense to squash them all into a, a, a unicameral parliament. And you'd have 22 top-up seats, proportional seats, and 47, or, or something like that. Um, so then, the argument for in favour of MMP because it would be fair is countered by an argument against it because it would change the basis of the way that the parliament works. Mm. There are there are there are several examples in Europe. Um, Greece is probably the best known. They've got a straight PR parliament but whoever's the biggest party gets an extra 50 seats on top. So they wanted proportional representation, but they wanted to try and ensure you got majority government as well. And there's a whole bunch of rules about short-term parliaments and the sort of electoral system that's used. Another case is Malta, which uses the, a variant of the Hare Clark system, what we call Hare Clark. Um, when they had an election about 20 years ago and the party with the most votes didn't actually win, they introduced some form of top-up as well. And then there's cases in um, Tasmania in the 50s where they had an even number of parliament and it's the only time in Australian history that there was actually a rule about how many votes a party got and whether it formed government or not. But I, the answer in New Zealand, in South Australia, is, um, is top-ups, I would think, because you can't get single-member electors to draw, uh, to guarantee anything. And the other thing I would say is that the whole South Australian thing is constructed on this thing called two-party preferred. And a couple of weeks, about two weeks ago, there was a poll published in South Australia which had Nick Xenophon polling about 25% of the votes in the next South Australian election. Yet they still published a two-party preferred. It was an absolutely meaningless figure. And the Constitution doesn't call two-party preferred, it talks about groups. How do you define a group? It's just, it just doesn't make sense. So I think there's, I think there's a number of issues in that area. But certainly, in the very basic answer to your question is, yes, the boundaries are less important in New Zealand because the parliament is determined by the national vote. Yeah. There's a second question here. Um, probably to the Victorian Electoral Commissioner, it seemed that in what you were saying that you, ha you by definition, are apolitical, whereas the South Australian system deliberately uses a political situation. Would you, well, I'll put it, <coughs> put it as a proposition. <coughs> it seemed to me we're in a much better position 
because of some fundamentals about politics in Australia and the party system. <coughs> it seems to me, I think Anthony has sort of <coughs> said that, that the problem with starting with the, the idea that the party with the most votes should become the government, you've got a problem there that it doesn't allow for um, new parties coming in for politics to in fact move so that you've got something that's different from the past. Uh, I just, I, my, I, in, a, in a question, do you agree with me that we're better off here in Victoria with apolitical, that is to say, when you're drawing the boundaries, you don't think about how it changes party votes in, in a particular area as a, as a factor of, uh, because that is not what it's about. It's about fair distribution. Look, look, absolutely, and not only not only in Victoria, but also in Western Australia as well, where I can say that, uh, that as these commissions form, in my experience, so that, that it's two commissions there, there has been no consideration whatsoever about uh, about the impacts of what <coughs> in relation to political outcome. No, it doesn't get discussed, it doesn't get raised in any of the uh, considerations around the table as to what are the effects politically in relation to the decisions that are about to be taken with these matters. It's not entertaining, and, and I can say that openly. I think Vanessa answered that too. South Australia has a particular case. Um, equality was introduced, but if you draw a set of equal boundaries in South Australia, one of the parties is automatically disadvantaged. Um, that's the geography of the state, and that's why this whole issue has come up in South Australia, and much less so in other states, because most of the other states don't have quite a disadvantage built in. The old um, Bielkimander, uh, the, the, the zonal system in, in Queensland, it probably didn't stop the Labor Party winning an election. I mean, Labor Party wasn't going to win because it was like, dysfunctional in the 70s and 80s. Um, but it probably had a massive effect on the Liberal Party. The Liberal Party couldn't grow because it was sort of compartmentalised in the high quarter of the South East Side. Um, but it wasn't, it was the use of the boundaries in that way. Once the, that fairness criteria, once the zonal system was done away with and the system became much fairer, um, because there wasn't something institutionally making it difficult for one side or the other to win. And that's the case in most of the states. Um, if the boundaries are equal, there isn't really a huge disadvantage. The South Australia is clearly one state where it would occur. It did used to be an issue in Victoria. It sort of finished in 1999. If you go look at pre-99, when Labor swept Ballarat and Bendigo and Seymour and all those sort of seats, they won a whole bunch of seats which they'd never previously held at one hit. And ever since then, Labor's done quite well in those seats. And the the swings in this state are now much fairer because Labor doesn't have an outside Melbourne disadvantage like it used to. So the, the fairness has been resolved by the Labor Party focusing on the area of its weakness. Now, to reverse my argument about South Australia, it may be the Liberal Party hasn't paid enough attention to actually broadening its base. Dunstan undid the playmander, undid the pound apportionment by focusing Labor's effort on winning some of these tiny country seats which had very small populations and a whole bunch of voters that had, you know, particularly in the upper house where voting was voluntary, they put in a big enrolment drive to get workers onto the roll and they won an extra upper house province at one of the elections in the early 70s. And at that point, the Liberal Party realised the game was up and they couldn't keep the gerrymander, the old malapportionment system in place and they had to buckle under that sort of system. Um, so the Labor Party ta targeted itself to try and undo the system. Also because they couldn't change the boundaries again one last time. Adelaide was flowing over the country boundaries and so there was all these tiny cities on the edge of Adelaide which were suddenly becoming Labor voters as they became suburbs instead of orchards. So sometimes a party has to focus on the problem it has and deal with it. So I think the Victorian Labor Party has. And that's my perhaps point. the South Australian Labor Party, Liberal Party hasn't done enough of that. And that's my point. It's about politics. It's about the ongoing. What a party does in an election should be what the politics is about, not how the election yeah. has been set up. By electoral I, I think That's it's why I think we're saying Victoria is much better. I think I think the Liberal Party thought they were going to fall into government in 2014. Even though they didn't get the boundaries they wanted, they thought they were just going to fall into government to an extent. Um, they'll probably get some more something more like the boundaries they want this time because there's been two elections in a row. There seems to be a new voting pattern have developed where 
of the previous two decades have been a different sort of voting pattern, so they'll probably get a different result this time. Yeah. But some, on, some of the arguments, the criticism you heard of that redistribution commission is that somehow they should have gone out of their way to draw a set of boundaries that the Liberal Party couldn't lose on the last election. It's not their job to do that, it's to try and be fair, and I think that doesn't mean you deliver a result that somebody wants. Yeah. Can I ask a follow-up question? I mean, follow-up question, I suppose, is that if you include partisan effects or political effects in the, as a criterion, does it inappropriately politicize the process? So it's a question for Jenny and everybody else, and maybe also reflecting, for example, the American process. Are we, you know, where both the, the criteria actually affects the perception and leads of impartiality of the process? Um, does that make sense, sorry? Yeah. <laughs> South Australia has a much more court-oriented process yeah. than Victoria does, or perhaps Western <coughs> Australian process. Um, witnesses are sworn in. Uh, the, the commission sits in the federal court building, and you know they're all up in the judges' staring. Um, we bow when we walk into the room. You know, visitors bow. Um, the, the Parties have counsel, and it's the counsel who question witnesses. This time, the commission itself has its own counsel, which um, is leaving the chair able to listen to what is said, rather than in the past the chair sort of guiding the proceedings. Um, it seems to me that that the party hope that in, in, in the West Australian or the Victorian or the New South Wales process or the federal process, the parties hope that they can argue on the basis of community of interest and that the commission won't really understand what, it's go what is going on. So they'll argue, for example, for a district <coughs> to be that shape rather than that shape. And they say, well, it's because the railway line goes across that way, and this way we've got 12 stations in it, whereas if we did it that way, it's only two or three and, and a couple of highways. And actually, when you look at the district, um, it turns out that there is some reason why they want to keep that shape. There's a political reason why they want to keep it that shape. I went, one of the, um, I was doing a case study of the federal redistribution in Victoria and Shane Eason came in for, for uh, the ALP. He, he basically works in the Eastern States for the ALP and does all of their redistribution submissions. And he said to the commissioner, look, if you start at Little River, now I, I don't know this, this state, but he said, if you start at Little River, it's a boundary that's never been crossed, he said, so, you know, it's that thing. Start at Little, Little River and then you work your way around and then this one falls into place and that one falls into place. And this is what Anthony was talking about before in terms of where you start. And then, there you go, you get this map. And I thought, why Little River? What does this do? But nobody could have argued against that submission by saying, well, of course you do that because it gives you an advantage. Because that's not something that the commissioners could take into account, that advantage business. I mean, to South Australians, it just seems blinkered because our commission has has had to take political arguments into account. And no American would, would countenance. I mean, Americans love the idea of independent commissions if they can get them, but they wouldn't ever ask them not to look at the political basis of a redistribution. They, you know, it would just seem ludicrous. So I suppose having been over to, to the US to speak to people in New Jersey where they have an independent commission where there's a, <coughs> a chairman who comes in from outside. He's always been an academic from Princeton or one of the local universities. And the, a chairman way back, Donald E. Stokes, used a couple of um, particular criteria which he said would deliver a fair map and they've just sort of built it in since then. And so I thought, okay, well perhaps, you know, perhaps that would be helpful for South Australians. But in that process nobody argues on the basis of 
and that that they weren't looking at the political consequences of you know it was it was just seen ludicrous. Now Victoria is very happily very distributed. There's there is a Labour vote in the countryside because there are cities with with um, a reasonable number of Labour votes. Bendigo, Ballarat, Shepparton. You know, in South Australia, we've got 13 rural districts and Labor wins one. It's just a different, different geography. I, I would say on the South Australian example, the thing that South Australia did was try and come up with a measure of this, which yeah. is put into the Act. Mm -hmm. And and I know I, I still tend to hold the view that if they'd allowed it to be discussed as one of the lower order priorities, mm -hmm. you could have had an argument in South Australia, you could have agonised um, before the criteria came in, Port Augusta and Port Perry were put in the same electorate, which gave mm -hmm. a Labor a nice seat in, in the country. Um, if you split those two towns up and put them in the surrounding areas, you've got two relatively marginal Liberal seats. Just that one change would have stopped, lo lo stopped Labor winning the 89 election. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes you can get too hung up in trying to come up with a measure, which is what they did. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes if you've got something like South Australia, I mean, an example in New South Wales, uh, another Shane Eastern Beauty was um, a city called Carlingford in, in northwest Sydney which brought Borkham Hills and Carlingford together, a nice sort of um, a safe liberal seat, very solid liberal, just at the top of the North Shore Hills line. Down the bottom where you had the housing estates in Rydalmere and Ermington, which I keep talking about, they were split and it created a Labour seat at Ryden, a Labour seat, a marginal Labour seat at Parramatta. So just locking up all the Liberal votes in the northern <laughs> bit, the seat running east-west, created two marginal Labour seats below. They're the sort of things you can look at a map sometimes in the submissions and you see exactly what they've done is they've locked up all the Liberal voting one seat to create a bunch of Labour seats around it. Um, Shane Easton's a specialist at doing that, so I, I, nice to hear his name mentioned. But uh, that's sometimes where I think maybe if you've got a problem with the fairness in a state, some criteria that allows it to be discussed in a broad sense. Mm -hmm. But I always think the South Australian problem, talking about groups, created this terrible problem with two-party preferred, and what does it mean, and what's the measure of fairness? Is it the median... I mean, Jenny's been through it all in the book, median value, the, the difference between the, the average and the total. There's a whole bunch of different measures you could use. Which one's the most appropriate? Well, it's, it's very difficult to work out. And the Commission has tied itself in knots with endless reports um, explaining its methodology. And it's, uh, it's kind of, uh, you, you've done well just to read through all those reports, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> can, I, can I add one more thing? Um, the reason why um, I had understood commissions other than South Australia as being sort of minimal change, having a minimal change um, uh, <coughs> orientation was because it seems to me that if I were a commissioner, if I was in that position, I would have an attitude which I think they have, but, you know, I stand to be corrected, which is that if a seat changes hands from one party to another, I want it to be the voters who do, who do that rather than me. Because I'm supposed to be apolitical. I'm, this is an independent commission. Um, I'm just redrawing boundaries. And so, so <coughs> how do I know that I'm not inadvertently changing a seat from Labor to Liberal? How do I know that I'm not inadvertently giving Labor a National Party seat and a Liberal seat and allowing, you know, an advantage to be created? Or how do I know that I'm not... Well, I suppose the problem is you, you might be perpetuating a bias, but anyway. <laughs> so, so how do I know that I'm not doing that? Well, I know that people are roughly happy with the current map. So that's why I try to... I mean, obviously, no redistribution starts with a blank slate. Every redistribution starts with the current map. But if I can make the changes... It's, it's very hard to... Also, once it's started the process, it's very hard to change it. If you've... You know, I, I remember once being in a commission, commissioner's office as I was ploughing through submissions, and I heard this sort of great harumph from the commissioners all came out of the office and stomped down the corridor, and, and the technical person sort of said... They got all the way down the north coast and then the numbers didn't add up, oh. which meant that's starting. You know. um, <laughs> um, and, you know, it's actually getting slightly easier these days with the computers. But that's the sort of thing. I mean, if you've gone so far um, and you run into a problem, if you look to follow the New South Wales redistribution, there's a lot of unhappiness of what they've done with a couple of the boundaries. Well, the final boundaries came out and all they did was basically 
rotate the population between about eight electorates in a circle. Because if they'd actually done something more fundamental, they would have been unpicking all the way to the national state borders. So, I mean, that's, that's one of the difficulties. So I think that's why there is a bias towards not too much change. But it can cause problems worried in WA. Bunbury and Albany are obvious boundaries. But having drawn them, the lack of population in between is creating rather strange-looking creations for the other electorates. So two electorates have a beautiful community of interest and you suddenly find something rather strange going on in between. Yeah. Jenny, you, you don't go there with a the view that this will be a minimum change. You don't, you know, meeting one is not, you don't go there with that mindset. Right. And at, any, at every stage through the process, you revert back to the criteria or the factors. Right. What are the considerations? So, so if it comes down to a, to a debate, that's where you go. Right. What are the factors telling me I must consider? How do they how do they arrange themselves with respect to what we're trying to achieve? So that's what you keep reverting back. So you don't go there with a mindset. Mm. It's people you don't say we're going to go there. It's going to be a wholesale change. Mm. You sort of know, you, you go there unless you have to lose five seats. Unless you have to, to unless you have to add two in WA in two thousand and six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I must tell you, people, you are incredibly fortunate because, as far as I know, commissioners don't talk about this. Is that right, Jenny? So am I out of order? <laughs> 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 in, rise and in other states. In other states. Uh, uh, there, there, there was a couple, couple of controversial ones in New South Wales where the commissioners issued their report and there was no reasoning included. Yeah. Um, and yeah. That, that's usually a sign that the commissioners don't want to get involved in the discussion here. There's a bunch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the, the, the Victorian report, the last one, and, and full yeah. credit to the work that Paul did in relation to the support for that, and Liz as well, that every decision that was taken in relation to districts was explained. Mm. Every decision. Mm. So, so it was there. Really yeah. Mm. Mm. Oh, that's important to do as part of the transparency. Mm. Yeah. 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 We're a bit over time. I think we've got to say wrap it up there. So thank you very much to all our speakers. <laughs>